Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the font rendering series. In this episode, check it out, we've got a string being rendered to the screen. And that's not all. Not only can we do a string, but we can also make this completely dynamic. So you can add and change whatever that string is at runtime. Check this out. You can also change the color. You can also change the position. It's all dynamic. But there are some downsides that we will be addressing in future episodes. One big one is the fact that it doesn't really handle uh, characters that go below the baseline very well. You can see this Y just gets completely cut off. So does this G. And that is because of the way we are sampling texture coordinates. But the basis of this episode is going to be doing text layout and setting up a simple batch render to basically get text onto the screen very quickly, very easily. And these issues are pretty minor and we can fix them pretty easily in the next episode. Anyways, let's talk about how text layout will work. All right, guys, so this image is taken directly from the FreeType website, and I'm gonna use this sort of to just reference things when we are talking about the next steps of this font render. So basically, glyph metrics, there's quite a few. We have all these different things, and you can actually see right here, this is the reason we can't display that bottom half of the glyph, because the way we are extracting font information right now is not very helpful. It doesn't give us this information like the minimum Y. Uh, the bearing in the Y direction, the advance, which tells us how much to go in order to get to the next letter's start position. So these are all things that we will be adding in the next episode, but this will be a helpful guide for us just in talking about how we're going to do this next part. So basically, what do we need to do? Well, we have our screen, and what we would like to do is to basically dynamically add letters to the screen. And this is a little bit harder than you might think just because of the way OpenGL works internally, and we all know this. Uh, we've built a batch render in the game engine series, and this is gonna be very similar to what we did there. We're gonna be doing it a little bit differently though. So basically, say you have some string, and you want to display this string to the screen. Well, what we have to do is first, we have to allocate some memory on the GPU. And this will be our batches buffer, or the VBO. And we will attach this to a VAO, which will be our batch object. And we're only ever going to have one batch object because I've been looking around and it turns out that you can get away with just using one batch that gets flushed to the screen every time it gets filled up. And that is sufficient and actually pretty performant. So we have this batch that has a vertex array object, VAO, which has a VBO attached to it, which is just a buffer full of some memory. Now, this memory is gonna be empty because we want it to be empty at the start of every frame so that we can start adding stuff to it. Then when we get this string, what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through every single character. And so the first character we'll be on is the character S. Well, we'd like to place the character S at position X, Y, which may be any world coordinate position in the screen. So say this is X, Y here. Uh, I'll put it down here just so we can draw the S right here. So basically what we wanna do is we want to extrapolate S's dimensions out into a square. That way we can sample from our texture that we uploaded and basically just blit S onto this square. So the easiest way to do this is to just go forwards by S's width. So this would be S's width or this uh, value right here. So just that is the width that we actually have gathered from our font information. And then what we can do to get this coordinate is we can just go up by S's height, which we also have stored in our font information. And then we'll have all the points, right? Because if we already have X and Y, which is this coordinate right here, and we just add width and height, then we get this coordinate right here. And then we can get these two coordinates just from using these values, these two vectors. So once we generate each of these points, all we do is we upload the vertex attribute data here. So then we would put in like X, Y, and then we would put in the color here, so RGB, which would be the color for this vertex. And then you could put in uh, the texture coordinates, so UX and UY for this coordinate right here. And then you would do the texture coordinates here, texture coordinates here, texture coordinates here, uh, color for all of those as well. And we would just stuff them inside of this array. Now, this is where the sort of interesting part is. So the easiest way to implement this batching is for the next character, we would end up getting a T. Well, what do we do once we get the T? Well, we just continue where we left off inside of this array, as long as we have space for four more vertices. If we still have space for four more vertices, we just stuff T into the array. We get to R. 
Well, do we have enough room in the array? Say we don't. Say we have no more room in the array for R. So that means we go to the next step of our batch rendering, which is to flush whatever contents we have to the screen. And so this flush, we basically just say, okay, let's buffer what we have inside of our CPU bound buffer. So all this is happening on the CPU. Let's buffer that data to the GPU, which basically we can do with a GL buffer subdata command, or uh, as you'll see, a, be a buffer data buffer subdata command, and I'll explain why we do it that way once we get to it. We upload that data to the GPU, then we call draw elements. Once we draw all those elements, now this buffer is no longer needed, right? Because we've positioned everything. It's on the screen now, the screen that's gonna be placed in the next draw call or the next swap buffers. So we don't really need to hang on to this anymore. So then we can actually add R to the array, except we'll say, hey, go back to the beginning of the array now. We'll just say, now we have nothing in the array. We're just gonna treat it like its size is zero. And then we repeat the process. We just keep going, we keep going, we keep going, adding stuff. And then at the end of the frame, we call flush one more time, just in case we never reached the end of the array. Say we stopped halfway in the middle. This will make sure that we flush out those last remaining elements. They get drawn to the screen and then we can move on with our day and we have everything drawn to the screen here. So the things I want you to keep in mind as we're coding this, we're working on three main concepts. We have one VBO, which is just a buffer attached to the GPU, and we have a copy of it on the CPU side. Every frame, we dynamically add all the information to this buffer on the CPU. Once the buffer fills up, we flush it to the GPU by buffering it. We draw it, and then we reset the size, and then we continue adding more characters. Then at the end of the frame, we flush one more time, repeat the process, and then we can swap buffers and move on to the next frame and everything will be fine. Okay, so let's actually code all this and see how it works. All right, guys, so where did we leave off with the last episode? We left off drawing this horribly ugly colored red A. <laughs> and now uh, let's get rid of this scarlet letter and continue with our font metrics and actually build a true font render. So we need a batch and uh, the way I coded this in C++ is I'm going more towards a functional style of programming. So if you don't like the way I'm programming this, that's fine. You can object orient it and stuff. Feel free to do that. Uh, I'm just writing in a way that I feel comfortable writing this. And this is the way I'll do it. So I will create a batch class. And this is going to store sort of all the main information for our batch. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to our window class and copy the vertices and the indices because we will no longer need these inside of the actual window class. These are going to be in the batch only. And I'm going to go ahead and actually comment out these vertices. We're just going to have them there for reference. The indices will be helpful in just a minute. So what else are we going to need? Well, we are going to need a batch size. So we're going to say static int batch size equals 100. So we're going to store up to 100 vertices or uh, 25 quads. So this will store up to 25 quads and you can increase that size if you want, do some performance testing, profile it, see what's the fastest for your specific use case and you can tweak all that stuff. Next, we're gonna say public static int vertex size equals seven. How do we know it's seven? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven floats in one vertex, that's all that is. Okay, and then we can create that float array that's actually gonna contain all the vertex data. We'll call this vertices and we will say this is a new float of size batch size times vertex size. And then we will set another variable called size equal to zero. Size is basically going to be what our current length is. So however many vertices we actually, or not vertices, well, yeah. So however many vertices we have in here. So if this is one, this means we have seven floats. If it's two, it means we have 14 floats and so on and so forth. And then we are going to have a private matrix for F projection, which I'm just going to set to a new matrix for F. Uh, this will just be for shader purposes to make sure we can have a nice canvas to draw on. And then we're going to say we need a public int VAO, public int VBO, public shader, shader, and a public C font font. And these are all just helper variables to make sure that we can track the state of everything that's going on. So the first thing that I'm going to write is a method to generate an element buffer object. So we'll say void generate EBO. Uh, this is just going to generate an element buffer big enough to hold 100 vertices. So we can initialize this, say element size equals batch size times three. 
And the reason we do batch size times three is because there are three triangles per one element or one, right? One triangle needs three indices. So that's why we're doing this. We want to store a hundred triangles. So we store three elements per triangle. And then we're gonna actually create the array to hold that. So we'll say element buffer equals a new int element size. Just create that temporary buffer. And we'll say for int i equals zero till i is less than element size, i plus plus. And I'm gonna do a little trick here. So I'm just gonna say element buffer i equals indices i mod six. And then we're gonna do plus uh, double parenthesis i over six times four. <laughs> so what the heck is this? It's just a simple way to use this base to sort of continue on. So we're gonna use the same pattern, it's zero, one, three, one, two, three, then the next one would be four, one, seven, five, six, seven, yeah. And then the next one would go, and it's the same pattern every time. So we there's no reason for us to like manually write that out. So we can just use this one as our base. And then we basically just say, okay, for every index, we can just go I mod six, which will get this, for zero, one, two, three, four, five, for all the multiples of zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And then we just add i over six, which will get us like for on zero, if we're in the number zero through six, we'll get zero, six through 12, we'll get one, so on and so forth, times four, which will increase it up three, then the next one will be four, next one will be eight, okay? It's a little bit confusing, look at it for a little bit, and you'll see how that works out, okay? Anyways, so we do that, and then we're gonna say EBO equals GL gen buffers. So then we're just gonna buffer all this data to the GPU and we'll say GL bind buffer, GL element array buffer, EBO, import that. And we'll say GL buffer data, GL element array buffer. And we wanna pass it the actual buffer that we just created. And we'll say GL static draw. And not stack overflow, but static draw. Okay, and then we'll import that as well. So we just actually buffer this array to the GPU so that it can use it and we bind it so it'll be the most recently bound thing. Next thing we're gonna need is some way to initialize the batch. So we'll say public void init batch and we will first of all set up the projection in here. So I'm just gonna say projection.identity, reset it and then say projection.ortho and we're gonna do 0, 0800 to 0, 0600. So basically treat the screen as if it's 800 by 600 pixels tall and then I'm gonna do one for the near Z plane and 100 for the far Z plane. That should be fine. Um, and then we basically want to create the vertex attributes, which we've already done conveniently right here. So I'm just gonna copy all of that. We're gonna go back into the batch and paste it right here and hit okay to import all that stuff. So now this creates a VAO. Uh, the VBO we want to keep track of, so just make sure to not declare it there. And I'm also going to remove that because we don't want to use these. So just remove those. I think it's nicer. You can keep it if you want. Anyways, so just making sure this is all correct. So we generate a vertex array. We bind the vertex array, generate a VBO, bind the buffer. And then we buffer the data. But we want this to be GL dynamic draw. And we want to, instead of uploading the vertices, we're just gonna tell it the size, so how much we want, which is float.bytes times vertex size times batch size, right? Because if we look at this, we have batch size times vertex size floats available, and then we just need to tell it that in uh, floats, so in bytes, so then we just multiply that by bytes, and that should be good. So that allocates enough memory for us to use, and then instead of doing the EBO right here, I'm just gonna say generate EBO, which we'll use that function we did. It'll bind the EBO to this VAO and we should be good. And this should be good. We're not changing anything about the vertex attributes. Nice, so that should be fine. Okay, now we want a way to actually add a string. So I'm gonna stub this out sort of. We're gonna say public void add text or add string, whatever you want. It'll take in a, a string, which is the text you wanna do, int x int y, which is the world coordinates you wanna place this at. We'll give it a scale factor which is like how much bigger than the original font size you want. And then we'll take an integer, which is RGB in a hexadecimal format. So then what we will do is we'll say for int i equals zero until i is less than text dot length i plus plus. We'll say char c equals text dot get i or dot char at i. And then we will say char info equals 
and char info equals font dot get character c so we get the character info for this character and we're gonna say if char info dot width equals zero uh, just return you can print out an error message if you want this just means we basically don't know what this character is so i'm just gonna say system dot out dot print line unknown character plus c basically means we didn't generate anything because if you remember for fonts we basically said if we can display it, we'll generate it, but otherwise we just sort of don't give it anything. And then it would just return zero for everything. So yeah, anyways, once again, so we do that, we return if we don't really know what to do for this, or actually instead of returning, you might be able to continue with the string, we'll just continue. So that's a little bit better. Now let's say flow x position equals x. Uh, we're gonna tweak these later on, which is why I'm doing this. Technically you could just use x and y directly. And then what I'd like to do is say add character at x position, y position. And then I'll give it the scale. I'll give it the character information and I'll just give it the RGB color I want it to be. And this should just add the character to our batch. That's what that's gonna do. And then we wanna pre prepare for the next letter. So we'll just say x plus equals character info dot width times scale. So we just increment the X coordinate, which means we go right. So if we had like the character W, we would jump over past W's width so that now we are on the X coordinate for I. And then the next iteration, we will be at the appropriate X coordinate. We continue, we continue, we continue. Cool. We need this function though. How do we add a character to our batch? Well, let's go ahead and say public void add character. And this will take in floating point number x, floating point number y, it will take in floating point number scale, uh, character information, char info, and an integer RGB, which is exactly what we passed in down here. So now we need to make this magically add all the data to this vert vertex array. And then we also need a way to actually get that data to draw once it gets full. So what we're gonna say is if we have no more room in the current batch, flush it and start with a fresh batch. And this is something that once again, we won't have right now, but we'll get around to it. So we'll say if size is greater than equal to batch size minus four. So if we don't have enough to add four vertices, which is what's needed to draw one quad, right? There's four vertices in one quad, then we're gonna flush the batch. And that should just do what we want it to do. We'll get around to that once we get around to that. Anyways, let's extract the RGB information out of that integer. So we'll say float R equals float RGB shift right 16 anded with 0xff over 255.0f. This is the similar trick to what we did in that last episode. We're just shifting some bits around so that we can uh, pass this in as a hexadecimal character. I find it a little bit easier to work with hexadecimal just because that is what you usually use uh, when you're working with something like HTML. So anyways, we get the RGB information out of that. Shift right 16, then eight, then zero. Divide by 255 to normalize that. Then we'll say float x0 equals x, float y0 equals y, float x1 equals x plus scale times char info dot width, and then float y1 equals y plus scale times char info dot width. So if you remember my horrible drawing, and that should actually be plus height, <laughs> My horrible drawing showed that we need the bottom left corner, x0, y0, and the top right corner, x1, y1, which we could get just by adding the width and the height, and then we multiply by the scale just to make sure that if they have it scaled, we scale it appropriately. Okay, and then we'll say float ux0 equals char info dot texture coordinates, 0 dot x, float uy0 equals char info dot texture coordinates, 0 dot y, and I'm gonna duplicate that and I forgot an equal sign there, <laughs> that's important. And we're gonna say ux1 equals texture coordinates one dot x, uy1 is texture coordinates one dot y. And before I forget, let's actually fix that up because don't know why I did the texture coordinates the way I did in the first place, but we can fix it, so there's no big deal there. Uh, instead of doing four texture coordinates, which is just, there's no reason, we just need two texture coordinates, one with x0, y0, one with x1, y1. And we're gonna do this as x0, y1, and we're gonna do this as x1, y0. Don't ask me why we had to flip the y1. We're doing this because of 
the way we kind of messed it up over here. So just flip that, that should be fine. But anyways, that'll make sure we get the correct texture coordinates inside of here. Okay, so now we have all the information we need to actually write into the vertices array, right? We have all of that information. Now we just need to generate four vertices which correspond to the correct position, the correct color, and the correct texture coordinates. So we'll say, first of all, int index equals size times seven. So we want to place these starting at however big we have, times seven, because there are seven floats per vertex. And then we'll just go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and copy this so that I don't waste time just doing this, which isn't very useful. Anyways, we say vertices index. So the first one is X1, then we do index plus one is Y1. So literally all we're doing is X1, Y1, RGB, UX1, UY1. Then we do X2, Y2, RGB, UX2, Y, so on and so forth. That's all we're doing here. And so this is basically the first one. We get X1, Y1, R, G, B, UX1, UY1. Then we're gonna go ahead and copy that. And I'm gonna go index plus equals seven because now we're on to the next vertex. And this one, if we look up here at our reference is gonna be uh, one, one, one. So the first one was one, zero. This one should be one, one. And if we look, this is one, should be zero. Maybe that's why my texture coordinates weren't working right. Okay, we'll fix that real quick. So one zero, and then this one should be one one. So we're good here. Copy all this. And look at our reference one more time. Uh, this one should be zero one, and then we're left with zero zero after this. So let's switch this to zero, and let's switch this guy to zero. Now we got zero one, zero one, we're good. We have one last vertex to do, and that is zero zero. Switch that to zero, zero, switch that to zero, zero. Cool, so now we have all four vert vertices added. And since we have added four vertices, we're gonna say size plus equals four. That way we keep track of how many vertices we have added. And remember, each vertex has seven floats. That's why we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven attributes that we update here. But this is one vertex, this is one vertex, so on. Okay, so we're almost done with the hard part. <laughs> we have this way to add text, and we basically just add each character to this index array that we're just building up. And then we want to be able to flush a batch if we ever run out of room. So the way we can easily flush batches is just by saying flush batch. And inside of here, first what we're going to do is we're going to clear the buffer on the GPU and then upload the CPU contents and then draw. This is sort of the process we go through. So we'll say GL bind buffer, GL array buffer, VBO. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say GL buffer data, uh, GL array buffer, float.bytes times vertex size times batch size, and we're gonna say GL dynamic draw. So what we do in this step is we're saying, hey, GPU, give me some memory size of, of this. This is the size I need. So it's gonna allocate some new memory. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say GL buffer subdata, uh, GL array buffer, zero vertices. Uh, so basically then we just upload all of our vertex data. And you might say, you're probably wondering why the heck do we clear the buffer on the GPU then buffer subdata? Why don't we just do this all in one step? We can do this in one step, but I read online and through performance testing and stuff, I realized that this is actually just as fast, if, if not a little bit faster than doing this all in one step. And the reason being because GPUs, the way they work, uh, programmers have been doing it this way for a while. They basically clear the buffer, then just buffer a whole big chunk of data once they allocate some new space. And so the GPUs basically, uh, frame by frame, first it allocates a new buffer, it allocates, it allocates, it allocates. Then it realizes, hey, they're allocating these buffers that are the same size. So then the next time you say clear it and give me a new one and then buffer the data, it says, well, I already have this empty one right here. I'm just gonna use this. Then it uses this, then it uses this. And then it just sort of loops around and keeps using the same buffers. So uh, GPU hardware designers are smart and have corrected for programmer errors. And so we can now code like this and it is pretty efficient. Anyways, we wanna draw the buffer now that we just uploaded. So we're gonna say shader.use, wanna use the shader. We're gonna activate the texture. 
Uh, actually, this is all code that we already wrote. Why write it again? So let's just go here. We have all of this right here. Let's just copy that, go into the batch, paste it. And we'll say okay to that. Okay, so instead of font shader, we're just using shader. So copy paste that over there. So we activate the texture, we upload the texture, we upload the uniform, and then I'm also gonna say shader dot upload mat 4f u projection, and we're gonna give it the projection. We don't have this yet in, in the shader code, but we'll add that in just a second. We bind the vertex array, and then we want to draw elements, but we want to draw however many we have, so size times six, which should draw however many elements are actually in this batch. Then we want to, very importantly, reset the batch for use on next draw call. So we'll say size equals zero. So basically what this does is when we start writing into this float array the next time, uh, we end up just writing into the beginning of the array since we're at zero now, right? Because if you look here, we say index is size times seven. Well, now size is zero because we've just flushed the batch. So we just start writing into the beginning of it again. And then that way we just overwrite all the data. And then once we have to flush again, we just do the same thing. And then we flush, we rinse and repeat. It's pretty cool and not too complicated to understand, which is why I like this method. And also dynamic batching, I did some testing too. So you may be saying, why would we build this every frame? Isn't it better to like build a static buffer where you say, I know this text is gonna be in this place in the screen at the same time all the time. So only if it moves, then I'll just upload that piece of text that's changed. Well, GPUs like bigger memory chunks to be uploaded at once, which is why if we upload this whole batch at the same time, it's actually more performant. That's once again, I did testing on this and I was surprised to find out that I actually got about a 4% increase in speed and overall CPU cycle spent just because I do this all in one go instead of doing multiple GL buffer subdata. So weird stuff, look it up. I definitely encourage you to do that because it's really cool to learn about this stuff. Anyways, let's try and use this. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, we're gonna get rid of all this. Uh, get rid of this, don't need that. Get rid of this, don't need that get rid of this. We don't need that anymore. We're going to go ahead and get rid of this. Don't need that anymore. And yeah, that should be good. Get rid of this too. Don't need that. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and go down here and we'll just say batch batch equals a new batch batch dot shader equals font shader. And to do that, we'll just move that up there and then batch dot font equals font. And then we'll say batch dot init batch, which will initialize it. Then inside of here, I'm going to go ahead and say batch dot add text. Hello world exclamation. We'll put it at 200, 200. I'm going to do scale of one and a zero X FF, FF, FF. So that should give us a white color. And then we'll just say batch dot flush at the end of the frame. This is important. If we don't flush it at the end of the frame, then this won't actually fill up our batch. And so we would never see the text. So just make sure you always flush at the end of the frame to catch any small batches at the end of the frame. Anyways, so we do that. Uh, let's modify our font shader because we did add an extra parameter in here, which was uniform. So if we go ahead and go into the vertex portion of the shader and we just say uniform mat for U projection, then we can go ahead and use that projection matrix just by multiplying it over here at the position. So we just multiply that projection and then everything else should be fine, I believe. We might get some wacky letters or something, but we'll check that out in a minute. We get no letters, that's even better. <laughs> okay, and that was an easy fix. I forgot this, this threw me off when I first coded this and it was so annoying, <laughs> okay? Make sure you set this uh, inside your vertex shader, the Z to negative five because we set up our projection and we basically have to move the text away from the camera. Otherwise, if we set this to zero, it'd be like right on top of the camera and the camera couldn't see it. It was really annoying when I first had this and I was like, why is my code not working? So <laughs> make sure you change that Z value to a negative five. Now, if we run this, we get hello world. How awesome is that? Okay, we have completely dynamic batched rendering and uh, it's annoying because we don't have blending. So let's just very quickly Go ahead and say right below here, we'll say GL enable, GL blend, 
and then we'll just say gl blend func uh, gl source alpha and then we'll do gl1 minus source alpha and that should get us blending and then if we keep the text white we won't see it so I'll make it ff0 ab0 let's see what that looks like purplish cool we get like a pinkish color and then one last thing you'll probably notice uh, first of all we don't have the window resizing with the text but you can sort of see it looks like it has an outline which is kind of weird the reason we're getting that is once again if we go into the shader uh, we're using CCCC for the actual alpha the font color instead we should use 111 so a white color and then we'll just change the alpha to be whatever the alpha of the actual text is that way we get a nice sort of linear interpolation and then you notice the outline disappears because it's all being multiplied to be the same color as the text okay cool so we have dynamic text and if you were to go into this window you can add whatever text you want so you can say batch.add text uh, my name is Gabe and put it wherever you want so I'll put this at 100 300 I'll scale it up to 1.1 F and then I'll do 0 X F F we'll, we'll do a yellow nah we'll do a a 0 1 B B yeah so we'll do a yellowish color and then if we go ahead and do this one more time or a pinkish color purplish color <laughs> whatever Anyways, you can see that it prints out my name is Gabe and we get some artifacts here. This is just because our texture coordinate sampling isn't the greatest. And then it kind of cuts off at the bottom here and then we get the Y completely cut off. These are all problems that we will solve in the next tutorial. Uh, one fun thing real quick too, because I showed you that obfuscated text in the beginning, which was kind of cool. Um, if we go ahead and we just say up here, uh, random for like a Minecraft effect, right? If we do random, random, equals a new random we can basically generate a string that is 10 characters big so we'll say string message equals and then we'll go ahead and say for int i equals zero until i is less than 10 i plus plus message plus equals and then we'll do some obfuscation so we'll say random dot next int and the bound we'll do is z minus a which will give us a range between uh, a to z and then we'll add a then we just want to make sure we cast this to a char so basically we're just going to get a random letter lowercase letter and then we can go ahead and say batch dot add text message and then we'll do this at like 200 400 1.1 f and 0 x i'll do aa 01 bb again we run this then we'll get some cool obfuscation very cool right now we've got like basically the same thing that minecraft's got all right, guys, that is it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode where we will start fixing up some of these artifacts and using a different technique, sign distance field, which will scale well when the text gets larger and will allow us to get better font metrics by using the free type library. Anyways, that is it for today. I'll see you guys next time.